words to know. Bool, a government council of 400 men balancing the Areopagus. Legislative bill, the action of proposing a law, an idea for a new law. It agreed to give all political power to one man, a wealthy businessman and aristocrat named Solon. The government of Athens needed to provide more rights and protection for the common people. As a first step in this direction, Solon abolished slavery caused by debt. A man didn't have to sell his wife or children to pay off money he owed any longer. Solon was one of the seven wise men of ancient Greece. Today, Solon means a man who is a respected leader. Solon then created four groups of citizens. Members of the wealthiest two groups were allowed to serve on the Areopagus. Another group was allowed to serve on the Bull, an elected council. The Bull was made up of 400 men and served as a kind of balance to the Areopagus. Members of the Bull were elected and could only serve for one year. A fourth group, made up of the poorest people, could participate in an assembly. Between 4,000 and 6,000 men attended each assembly. This assembly acted as the voice of the people and had a lot of power. The council made recommendations about laws and state business, kind of like legislative bills today. The assembly discussed these recommendations and voted on them. The men of the assembly voted to elect officials, declare war, grant citizenship, and spend public funds. The assembly had direct authority in affairs of the state and the council enforced the decisions made by the assembly. Democracy. The word democracy comes from the Greek term for people's rule. Democracy allows all the people of a governed body to vote on matters of importance, allowing the voice of the majority to be heard. Ancient Greece gave the world its first experiments in democracy, and although these experiments lasted less than 200 years, the lesson learned more than 2,000 years ago have had a major impact on most of today's governments around the world. Greek Justice Areopagus, members of the wealthiest two groups. Bull, elected council. Assembly, poorest group of citizens. People accused of a crime in ancient Greece were subject to the judgment of a jury of their peers. Each year, 6,000 men were chosen to act as jurors, though not all of them sat on the same jury at the same time. These large juries made it nearly impossible for anyone to bribe the jury and influence the verdict. Jurors were selected by drawing lots and had to be at least 30 years old. They were paid a daily fee for their service. The courts were kept in order by a magistrate and the jurors usually voted twice, once to determine guilt or innocence and a second time to decide upon the penalty. The majority ruled, and there was no such thing as an appeal. The jurors' word was final. These changes got the common people more involved in politics, but didn't eliminate their complaints entirely. Solon left and Athens fell into anarchy, a chaotic period with no clear leader. Twice during this chaotic time, a man named Pisistratus tried to take over, but twice he failed. Out Among the Citizens American presidents like to visit factories, farms, daycare centers, and schools to find out what the person on the street thinks about the government's actions. More than 2,000 years ago, Greek leaders did the very same thing. Around 550 BCE, for example, our old friend Pisistratus often inspected the farms and country homes of his subjects. One day, after he had made a new tax on the income of farmers, he came across a farmer digging in a field of stones and asked what his income was. The farmer replied, just so many aches and pains, and of these pains, Pisistratus ought to take his 10% in taxes. Pisistratus was so surprised by the farmer's honesty that he gave the farmer a refund on all the taxes he had paid. Assembly Duty Many men had to travel from the countryside to the city of Athens to participate in the assembly. Sometimes, not enough men showed up. When this happened, a band of specially trained slaves went looking for those who had shirked their duty. Men who had neglected to show up at the assembly were swatted with a rope dipped in red paint and forced to pay a fine. Finally, Persistratus successfully took charge of Athens in 546 BCE and worked to restore order. He decided to turn Athens into a city of culture. He built new buildings and invited artists and poets to come to Athens. He kept the constitution that Solon introduced and increased the power of the courts that benefited the lower classes. As poor Greek citizens became more involved in the government by acting as assemblymen or jurors, the aristocrats were forced into a smaller role on the political stage, creating a more balanced government. Pisistratus died around 528 BCE and his son Hippias took over. Hippias was not a good leader and when Athens was attacked by Sparta in 510 BCE, Hippias escaped to Persia. 
Cleisthenes is important because, from 508 to 502 BCE, he helped create the world's first successful democracy. He granted citizenship to all free men living in Athens and Attica and formed a council and assembly that allowed those citizens to actively participate in government. One man, one vote became the guiding principle, a belief that still holds in today's democracies. Hippias, son of Pisistratus. Words to know. Peer, a person who is of equal standing with another in a group. Your friends are your peers. Magistrate, someone who administers laws. Anarchy, a chaotic period with no clear leader. Sparta, a warlike city-state in ancient Greece. Attica, Athens and the surrounding region. Athens, Greek wrestlers. While each city-state in ancient Greece was governed by its own people, by the time Cleisthenes' rule, Athens emerged as the prime example of democracy. For the first time in history, people had the ability to publicly voice their opinions and be heard. This freedom to think and share opinions spurred not only a democratic government, but also a desire for knowledge. Athens was filled with scholars, artists, scientists, and philosophers, people wondering how and why. Works by famous poets, philosophers, and mathematicians filled huge libraries. Artists carved great marble sculptures. Architects erected grand buildings. Away with you. Another powerful change in the new democratic system of Athens was the introduction of ostracism, a kind of reverse election, in which voters could decide to kick a citizen out of town for 10 years. First, citizens voted whether ostracism should take place. If this vote passed, each citizen could then write the name of the person they wanted to banish on ostraca, fragments of broken pottery. If more than 6,000 citizens participated in the second vote, then the person whose name appeared most often would be banished. This practice was a powerful threat against wealthy aristocrats who were considered dangerous or untrustworthy. If you bothered too many people with your actions, they'd get together and legally boot you out. At the end of the 5th century, the system changed so that people accused of wrongdoing were judged by a jury of their peers. The typical jury had several hundred people on it. One of these democracies is not like the other. While Athens had the first democratic government, its democracy was far different from what we have in the United States today. To begin with, while all citizens could serve in the government, few of the people who lived in Athens were actually considered citizens. Women, for example, were not citizens. Slaves and most foreigners were not allowed to become citizens, and male adults could only become citizens if both of their parents were from Athens. These restrictions meant that out of an estimated population of 250,000, only about 30,000 were actual citizens. Keep in mind, though, that the United States started its democracy in much the same way. Women couldn't vote in the United States until 1920. Slaves counted as only three-fifths of a person, and the slave owner, not the slave, got to use the vote. If Athenian democracy had lasted, perhaps it would have evolved as the United States has. But Greek democracy lasted less than 200 years, ending around 338 BCE, when the Greek world lost its independence. Another difference is in how government officials were selected. The United States has a representative government. Citizens decide to run for office, then we vote for one of these people to represent us. In Athens, your name was submitted with all the others and you might be elected to serve. Serving wasn't an option, it was a duty. If you refused to participate, you lost your civil rights and were shunned by others. With regular wars, the citizen soldiers of Athens could be called upon at any time to go to battle. Many kept themselves in good shape by participating regularly in rigorous sporting events such as wrestling, boxing, and chariot racing. Sparta. Things were different in Sparta, another powerful city-state in ancient Greece. Sparta's economy was based on slave labor. As the slave population grew, so did the threat of a slave revolt, so Spartans had to keep their slaves in check. These slaves, called helots, were monitored closely by the Spartans and treated cruelly. It was a rite of passage for those in training for war to stalk and kill helots who must have lived in constant fear. Coins in Ancient Greece Each city-state had its own coins, recognizable by a distinctive design. Coins were stamped to indicate how much metal they contained, and the markings on both sides of the coin helped to ensure that people wouldn't shave it to collect bits of the valuable metal. A silver coin of the Seleucid king Antiochus IV. The Spartans saw militaristic life as a way for men to reach their full potential. Because the men of Sparta spent all of their time striving for militaristic perfection, they were always ready for war. 
They developed and practiced complicated maneuvers designed to surprise enemies on the battlefield. Spartans practiced moving in the dark without the aid of torches, and Spartan men spent all day practicing to be soldiers. The women and slaves took care of the daily chores necessary for the city-state to survive. Spartans were ruthless in their quest to produce fine soldiers. Boys were taken from their mothers at the age of seven to begin military training. Boys became soldiers at age 20. Sparta never achieved the democratic ideals of Athens. It was ruled by a military oligarchy during times of war and a senate of 30 in between wars. Sparta did contribute to the rise of democracy and culture in Athens, though, by helping to defend all of the Greek world from Persian invaders in the 6th century BCE. Without Sparta, Athens could not have flourished. In the end, Sparta was also responsible for the decline of Athens in the 4th century BCE as the two city-states battled each other in war after war. Spartan Soldier Chapter 2 Farming, Trade, and the Greek Way of Life At the height of ancient Greek civilization, there were an estimated 250,000 people living in Athens alone. The area surrounding Athens, called Attica, was home to another 250,000. While Athens was a bustling city-state, life in the countryside was quiet and slow-paced. The people in the countryside were conservative, which means they liked things to stay the way they had always been. The people who lived in Attica were mostly farmers, raising crops in the open countryside. The farmers of Attica viewed the Athenians as lazy and frivolous with their money. Athenians, with the educated and worldly ways, considered farmers to be old-fashioned, dim-witted, and miserly. But Athenians depended upon farmers to supply their city with food, and the farmers of Attica needed the city people to buy it. Farmers worked hard from daybreak to sunset, growing and harvesting the food that would feed their families. What the farmer didn't need for his own table was sold to the Athenians at the Agora. The Agora. At the heart of each city-state was the Agora. This busy place was the economic, religious, and cultural center for the region. Every day, farmers and local craftspeople set up stalls filled with their wares. Think of the Agora as an ancient version of a supermarket. Farmers came from the surrounding countryside to sell fruits and vegetables, cheese, wine, and meat. Fishermen displayed fish fresh from the Aegean Sea. Craftspeople offered pottery, hardware, and books to passers-by. The men of the community came to the Agora every morning to purchase the day's food for their families. This gave them the opportunity to gather with other men from the community to hear the news or discuss politics. Shopping for food in ancient Greece was not just a necessity, it was a social activity. Surrounding the bustling activity of the Agora, you might find several temples, army headquarters, a court of law, a notice board with information about upcoming legal cases and new laws, and a prison. From fruit to wine. The grape harvest meant an abundance of fruit to be made into wine. Winemakers filled big containers with the ripe, sweet-smelling grapes, then a man would step right into the middle of the container and use his feet to crush them. As the grapes were stomped, the juice was released and accumulated in the bottom of the container. The juice was then separated from the grape stems and pulp. This was hard work. Forty pounds of grapes might only yield one or two gallons of juice. Once the juice was extracted, it was ready for the fermentation process, which could take another year or more. Making wine required lots of patience. Food for thought. The life of a farmer in ancient Greece wasn't easy. The land was rugged and much of it was too steep for farmers to cultivate crops. Farmers terraced the land to make more usable space by creating big steps in the hillsides. Even in areas where the land was level, the soil was rocky and poor. To make matters worse, the climate of Greece is extremely arid. But people must eat, so farmers toiled to produce what food they could, cultivating crops that would thrive in tough conditions. Grapes, olives, and figs were the primary crops in ancient Greece. Other crops were grown as well, but weren't very important to the ancient Greek diet. Chickens and goats were raised to provide milk, cheese, and eggs. The majority of the grape crop was turned into wine. Olives, too, were turned into a liquid product. Olive oil was used for cooking, as you might expect, and also as fuel for lamps and beauty products and as soap of sorts to remove dirt from the body. Words to know. Agora, open air market. Fermentation, a process where something breaks down into a simpler substance. Crop. Plants grown for food or other uses. Terraced. Strips of level land cut into a hillside. Climate. Typical weather in an area. Arid. Very dry with little rainfall. Trade. Exchanging one thing for another. Export. To sell to another country. Trade. 
Bread was important to the ancient Greek diet, though wheat grew poorly. Farmers had greater success with barley, which was more tolerant of the tough conditions, and used it for making barley bread. Even so, farmers could not produce a sufficient amount of grain to fill the needs of the country, making trade essential. Greek merchant ships were loaded with exports of wine, olive oil, silver, and pottery sent to trade across the Mediterranean and Aegean seas. What about pirates? When trading ships ventured out to sea, they were at risk of being attacked by pirates. To combat this problem, Greek merchant ships were equipped with bow rams to fight off pirate ships. Projecting underwater from the bow of the ship, the copper-tipped ram could punch holes in enemy ships that came too close, causing the ships to sink. It was rare for people to learn how to swim during ancient times, even for sailors who spent most of their time on the open ocean. Because of this, causing a ship to sink was quite effective. The pirates on board would quickly perish as they found themselves in the water, unable to stay afloat. They even ventured into the Black Sea to trade. Goods from Egypt, Libya, Cyprus, Sicily, and Italy made their way back to ancient Greece on these ships. Athens imported metals, furs, and grain. The merchant ships were less than 100 feet long and graced with a single rectangular sail. The sail was used when winds were favorable. Otherwise, the ship was powered by men rowing in unison. The ships were open, with no place for the crew to escape wind, rain, and splashing waves. Because of the dangers of traveling in a vessel such as this, crews seldom left sight of land and would pull the ship onto shore at night or if seas became too rough. Counting cash. Tradespeople used a system called barter to make sure that each trade was fair. They set certain values on their goods, and in order for a trade to be considered fair, they needed to receive something of equal value. The earliest coins were probably lumps of metal stamped to reveal the metal's weight. These coins may have been given as pay to soldiers or used in trade. The coins recipient could use the metal to purchase goods. Around 600 BCE, Aegina, a city-state near Athens, made the first Greek coin that could be used as payment for goods. Around 590 BCE, Athens issued a coin made of silver called a drachma. Imprinted with an owl, which was recognized as Athena's symbol, drachmas were the most common currency in the Aegean world during the height of the Athenian Empire. Thales, circa 636 to circa 546 BCE. An ancient Greek famous for being a deep thinker, Thales put his knowledge to practical use as well. When he was mocked for thinking all the time and never working, he said, anyone can make money if he puts his mind to it. His friends challenged him to prove it. To do so, Thales first had to decide on the best way to make money. In the 6th century BCE, olive oil was such a necessity that he thought olives looked like the best bet. He learned as much as he could about the growing, harvesting, and pressing of the olives to make oil. He discovered that oil production had been down for the past few years, which led him to investigate weather patterns. The previous few seasons had produced very poor crops, but Thales predicted a change in the weather for the upcoming season that would mean a heavy crop. Thales toured the olive groves and purchased all the oil presses he could from the discouraged growers. The presses had been almost useless recently, so growers were happy to sell them. When the weather was favorable the following year, olive trees produced a huge crop. All the presses belonged to Thales. He had created a monopoly, and all of farmers who wanted to make oil were forced to pay a fee to borrow Thales' presses. This monopoly and Thales' thinking brought him great wealth. Olive Press Around 550 BCE, three drachmas might buy a bushel of grain, and a sheep was worth eight drachmas. The daily wage for a laborer was about one drachma. Some historians estimate that a family of four could live for four days on a single drachma. Only Sparta rejected the drachma, preferring to stick with the more familiar heavy metal lumps. This likely discouraged trade between Sparta and other city-states in ancient Greece. It wasn't until sometime in the 3rd century BCE that Sparta finally began to mint coins. As coinage became more common, most city-states minted their own coins, decorating them with eagles, owls, horses, and mythological creatures like Pegasus, the winged horse. Coins made in Athens wouldn't necessarily be accepted in, say, Aegina. To deal with this problem, money changers called trapezitae would set up tables in agoras and other public places. Visitors from different city-states could go to the trapezitae and exchange their coins for coins of equal value. When Alexander the Great conquered much of Asia in the 300s BCE, he spread the use of one Greek currency across the land. This made it much easier for people to trade as they traveled through different city-states. For a time, the drachma fell out of favor. 
The modern state of Greece reissued the drachma in 1832, and it was used until 2002 when Greece joined other European countries in adopting the euro. Current events. One type of dried fruit favored by the ancient Greeks was the currant. Currants are dried fruits, quite like raisins, only smaller. Ancient Greeks called them corinths after the polis where they originated. Over the years, the term evolved into currants, a name we still use today. You can buy currants at the supermarket. What was the flood like? Athenians ate two substantial meals per day. Their light lunch was called ariston, and dinner was called dipnon. Meat was eaten only a couple of times each week, and this was likely fresh fish, rabbit, deer, or pigeon. Meat was more commonly available in rural areas, as people had access to hunting and space to raise animals. In towns and cities, meat and fish were available at the agora. Grains, fruits, and vegetables were the main part of the ancient Greek diet. Breakfast might simply be a piece of bread dipped in wine. Lunch might be bread with cheese, olives, figs, dates, grapes, or currants. Supper was usually something like a thick porridge made from barley. Vegetables such as peas, garlic, lettuce, parsley, mushrooms, artichokes, or beets might accompany the porridge. While today's tables are almost always set with forks, spoons, and knives, the ancient Greeks considered it proper to eat with their fingers. For messier meals, a piece of flat bread might be used as a spoon. Words to know. Import. To buy from another country. Barter. To trade one thing for another. Monopoly. To control all of something in a market. Mint. To make coins. Mythological. Imaginary. Snack like a Greek. Some foods that were prepared by ancient Greeks are still common today. The ancient Greeks rolled pastry as thin as leaves to make spanakopita, or spinach pie, and baklava. They coined the term phyllo, or leaf, for their super thin pastry, because it was as thin as leaves. Spinach pie may not sound like something you'd like to try, but baklava is a dessert made with phyllo, honey, and nuts. You can try baklava for yourself. See the recipe at the end of this chapter. Another Greek food that you may recognize is feta cheese. The name feta, or sliced, was given to the cheese in the 17th century, but the history of this cheese goes back to the time of Homer. Feta cheese is special because it is made only from goat's or sheep's milk. According to legend, Polyphemus, the cyclops who imprisoned Odysseus, you'll read more about him in later chapters, is said to have been the first manufacturer of feta cheese quite by accident. He stored sheep's milk from his flock in animal skin bags. One day he discovered that some bags that he had left for a number of days were not full of liquid as he expected, but a firm mass of creamy cheese. The Symposium Wealthy Greek men liked to gather in the evenings for what they called a symposium. This was an evening of food, visiting, and laughter. Guests would recite poetry, play the lyre, a string instrument, or sing. While the women of the house were not included in the symposium, often a woman called the hetera entertained the men by dancing or playing music. The hetera was usually a foreigner, as it would be considered inappropriate for an Athenian woman to sing or dance for a group of men. Activity. Host your own symposium. Invite a group of friends to join you for an afternoon with an ancient Greek feel. In order to host your own symposium, you'll need to provide food, drinks, and entertainment. Here are a few ideas. 1. Send an invitation written on a scroll. Make sure to ask your friends to bring a favorite poem or short story to share. You can even suggest that they come in costume. The ancient Greeks wore simple tunics made of linen. Your guests can drape themselves with a white sheet. 2. The ancient Greeks lounged on couches called clines during their symposiums. Since you may not have enough couches for your guests, lay towels and pillows on the floor in a circle. Chill out. The ancient Greeks preferred their drinks chilled, so they stored their beverages in containers underground. While this worked reasonably well, those who could afford it used ice, which meal trains hauled from the mountains into the city every day. Summertime meals were prepared outside over an open fire. In the wintertime, a small stove called a brazier was used indoors for both cooking and heating the home. Houses had a small hole in the roof to allow smoke to escape. One special ancient Greek dish you are probably familiar with is an egg omelet. The Greeks filled theirs with cheese, honey, and sheep's brains. 3. Teach your guests about proper symposium behavior. It was considered bad form to drop a cup or laugh during a prayer, tap or whistle to music, or spit across the table at the wine pourer. 4. Small tidbits of food were served because they were easy to pick up with only one hand. Offer your symposium guests grapes, cubes of cheese, and small slices of bread. The ancient Greeks drank wine. You can serve grape juice. 5. 
For entertainment, ask each guest to share their favorite poem or short story with the group. You might have a book of poems on hand in case some guests forgot to bring a favorite. If one of your guests is a musician, ask him or her to perform. 6. Try playing a game similar to one played at ancient Greek symposiums. Choose a poem or nursery rhyme that is familiar to everyone. The first player should recite the first line. Going around the circle, each player adds a line from memory. See how far you can go. Rules of Relief Even though it was acceptable for men to relieve themselves out of doors, they had to be careful not to offend the gods. Hesiod, an early Greek poet, gave this advice. Do not urinate standing upright facing the sun, but remember to do it either when the sun has set or when it is rising. Do not make water either on the road or beside the road as you go along, and do not bear yourself. The knights belong to the blessed gods. A good man who has a wise heart sits or goes to the wall. The earliest bathtubs in ancient Greece were built by the Mycenaeans at the palace of Nestor at Pylos and were made from terracotta. The ancient Greeks kept themselves exceptionally clean. Many homes were equipped with a bath, a room that may have contained a terracotta tub as well as a basin that sat on a small table, used for washing hands and face. Some of the wealthier homes may even have had showers similar to those found in public bathhouses, with water piped in to spray on bathers. Water came to the city of Athens via terracotta pipes that fed public fountains. People carried empty vessels to the fountain, filled them with water, and carried them home. Dirty water was usually just dumped outside along with the other trash that people generated. Rubbish was often piled ankle deep along roadways making conditions in ancient Greece less than sanitary. Human waste, too, was a problem. There were no public toilets, but it was common for men to relieve themselves in public. With so many people in the city, the streets quickly filled with smelly waste. Dung collectors worked to clean up the mess, but by law could not dump the waste within half a mile of the city. Hauling waste that far was time-consuming and limited the amount of dung that could be removed each day. Ancient Greeks depended on clay jars to collect their toilet waste. Slaves disposed of the waste in these stinky jars as part of their job. It's a man's world. The male head of a wealthy family enforced household rules, controlled the family money, and arranged for the education of his children. His family, wife, children, and slaves were called oikos, meaning household. The head of the household spent much of his time in town educating himself or practicing his athletic skills, and the daily running of the home was usually left to his wife. Women from wealthy families in Athens were expected to supervise the household slaves. The slaves did most of the housework, cared for small children, and took care of certain tasks such as spinning and weaving. Wealthy women lived, for the most part, separately from all men who were not part of their oikos, seldom even speaking to them. Women and female children were confined to their homes except for special occasions, such as weddings and funerals. When the man of the house entertained his friends, women and girls were expected to retire to the women's quarters since it was considered inappropriate for them to mix with men who were not family members. In ancient Greece, if you weren't wealthy, you were likely poor and struggling to put food on the table. Women from poor families or slaves couldn't afford the luxury of staying indoors. They were needed to help fetch water, sell wares at the marketplace, or harvest crops. Some poor women worked for pay, weaving, harvesting grapes, or even nursing babies for wealthier women. Question, what is an oikos?